Good morning, New Beginnings. How is everybody this morning? It's good to see your beautiful faces in the house of the Lord. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. When we come together to worship our God, we are unified in declaring that he is Lord. Amen? He is Lord. He is Father. He is King. He is Sovereign. He is good. Are you ready to sing that out this morning? Amen.
Jesus. From the rooftops I proclaim that I am makes me think kind of on the reverse end of that it makes me think about the um when jesus said that people would come and say this and this and this and he, he would say i don't know you can you imagine <laughs> the security of knowing that we belong to him is a big big deal <laughs> the fact that we can say i am yours it's not just us saying hey god you're lucky <laughs> you know you get me <laughs> He's, he's not the lucky one in that, if you can say that. <laughs> We're the blessed ones. We're the ones who have received a big, big, enormous gift that we can say, I am yours, not just, hey, God, you know, you can have me. Good for you. We can say, I am yours and you are mine. Thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to say that I have to go away from your presence, that I don't have to leave because I'm unworthy, but that your son made the way for me. And I just feel that so strong this morning. That I am yours and it has nothing to do, people of God, it has nothing to do with what we have done. It has nothing to do with what we will do, but us receiving the gift that he has given us. And out of gratitude, yes, we serve him and we give our lives unto him. But everything is because of him and from him and for him and to him belong all things. Amen. Amen. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. David, a man that we see in the Bible, coveted something, had a man murdered so that he could have what he wanted, yet he is still a man after God's own heart. Tell me that's not mercy and grace. How can we be so judgmental here when David, a man after God's own heart? That to me screams of obedience. In spite of all that, David still loved, loved the Lord, repented, asked for his forgiveness, and he received it. And in my experience as a parent, one of the hardest things to do is teach our children of obedience. And then we can be so harsh on them, and I don't know about y'all, but I'm not obedient all the time myself. It's extremely difficult to be an example of something, teach something, and you're not a good example. Just keep that in mind and exercise that mercy and grace all day, every day. Our God is a good God. Please join us and lift him up this morning singing this song.
Good morning, new beginning. Has your heart ever been heavy? You know what it's like to sing to the Lord and realize that He is our hope? I want you guys just to keep standing with me for just a minute and praise Him. If you guys would just stay, we're going to sing that chorus one more time. But I just want to share the scripture with you this morning. In Romans 5, it says, We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. And I want to thank you guys who've been praying for hope for Bethesda. The more that I read and the more that I learn, and I even went back And if you've seen The Sound of Freedom, it's based off of actually a documentary that follows Tim Ballard's life. It's called Operation Tucson. And in that documentary, uh, one of the cases is in Haiti. And it was an orphanage that was acting as a front to traffic children. And one of the pastors in Haiti lost his son. And Tim Ballard was going after Gardy. And last night, me and Sarah were praying for Gardy. But as Tim went after Gardy, he ended up finding more and more and more kids. And the pastor and him were crying together because they were like, we've, they did a couple raids and they had, they had found all these different kids, but they didn't find Gardy. And he said that pastor was crying. And he goes, all of a sudden he had this joy, an unspeakable joy come over him. And he goes, he started smiling, and Tim goes, I couldn't figure it out because we didn't find his son what was going on with him. And that Haitian pastor said, if my son had to be sacrificed for us to find all these kids, it's worth it. It's worth it. And out of those 28 kids that they found, he went to the police station and he said, I'll take as many as you'll give me. And he's raising eight of those kids now. And he's still looking for Gardy. Will you pray with us for the nation of Haiti? Will you pray for us for the things that, for those who are hurting and those who don't have hope? For those who are looking for their children? But you know what? Those testimonies of Christians who say, Even in my suffering, it builds perseverance. And perseverance builds character. And that character builds hope of the Holy Spirit who will comfort you in all situations. And the problem in America is we've had too much. We're too fat on the gospel. There's a church on every corner. There's a meal at every corner. You can go out to eat and your biggest concern today is where you're gonna eat after church. There's a lost and dying world who needs a church that will get back on its knees and declare that Jesus Christ is our living hope. So praise team, let's just sing it one more time today. And church, sing to the Lord, for he is good and he is worthy of your praise. Sing it like you mean it. Did you come in the door this morning anticipating, expecting to worship the God of the universe? And let's pray for those who are on the front lines, those who are experiencing that and and showing the world that it is not about us. It's not about what we do, but it's what Christ has done. And if we have to give up our son, you know what I thought about? I had Hunter sitting there with me. Would I give Hunter up? God did that for you. He gave his only son. Let's sing it one more time.
lift up your name today. We give you honor, glory, and praise that you are our hope. And there is hope for the world, and his name is Jesus. Father God, that we would claim that and we would rest in that. That it's not about what we do, but it's about what you did. And we thank you for that sacrifice that was made on the cross of your only son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may have a seat, church. I'm fired up. There's a world that needs saving, and there's a Savior who needs proclaiming. How many of you guys have heard the term missions exist because the world doesn't, or because worship doesn't? And our purpose in the church, I always say, just like in the Army, this is our FOB. How many of you Army guys know what I'm talking about? The FOB, the forward operating base. And in the Army, you have a st structure of bases that keep advancing the mission of the gospel going forth. And we're just so thankful for you guys joining with us in the 21 days of prayer because prayer is the engine and not the caboose of what we do. And, um, and this is a quote from Pastor Susie, out of the heart, Facebook speaketh. <laughs> right? You can tell a lot about what somebody cares about by what they share. And I just want to thank you guys for your, for your, just even if you comment your praying or share it, or like it, it's helped us to reach, well, I think on our campaign right now, we've reached like 2,500 people who haven't heard of Hope for Bethesda. And so we're just excited about that. That's good news. And we want to keep that ball rolling. And we also, sometimes I know we watch movies like The Sound of Freedom and these things going on, and you're like, what can I do? Well, each of you has a voice. You can advocate. You can pray right? There's places to give, to go. And so there's things that we can do to take action, church, just to be a part. And they're very, very simple things. Hitting the share button's not hard, right? Everybody show me your thumb. I think we all got working thumbs in here, right? All right? We can do it. Um, also, just want to just encourage you guys, uh, we got the boxes in the back. Until August 9th, we'll be collecting supplies for the AMI kids. Um, for those of you guys, uh, who don't know, we work closely with AMI Kids Program, uh, and if you uh, would like to donate to that, it would be a great blessing. The, there's a list at each of the boxes, so if you want to just take one of the lists with you, but it's basic school supplies. These boys are troubled youth who are in a program earning their way back to school, and they need support. And New Begins is uh, one of their major supporters. They do their graduations here. The boys can play archery tag. Um, and we've even had a chance uh, to share the gospel with them here in this very room. And so we want to just keep that going. Also, if you'd like to, um, grab a note card and write a prayer just to encourage a boy, a scripture or a prayer. We, If you'd like to give in that way, we would really... Uh, like to give those as well to encourage the boys for this school year just something on on a, on a regular note card you can drop them in the boxes just uh something to encourage them for this coming year so also uh there's a big back to school bash i'll have the information in the whatsapp and the facebook group for those of you who have, know families in need a lot of the churches in clay are doing a big backpack and we're just covering our area, which is AMI Kids. So thank you guys for that support. Pray for Pastor Jerry and Pastor Susie today as they embark on their trip. Uh, they are going to Alaska, on an Alaskan cruise with Amir Sarfati. Um, and we just pray that this would be a time of refreshing and just pour it into them. How many of you guys know Pastor's pretty, probably pretty pumped about hanging with Amir? I asked him, I was like, are you excited? Are you going to go to Mir? He's like, eh, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, right, yeah, right, is what I said. I said, he's probably pretty pumped. So they're just embarking today. They made it safely um, to Seattle, and they'll be leaving. Um, so you guys just keep them in your thoughts and prayers as well. If you need anything, we're here for you. Um, you know what they say, the easiest way to the Father is through the Son. So if you need anything, we're here, and um, we're just going to pray and dismiss our kids. Thankful for Patrick today. We've been praying for him, excited about the word he's getting ready to bring. But just, dear Lord, we thank you for our children as they go. 
We just pray that you be with them today. Just lead them, guide them in their discipleship, that they would grow and come to more, know you more as they learn to believe, defend, and proclaim your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Good morning, New Beginnings. How we doing? What's everyone doing this morning? It's my first time using the uh, orange mic or whatever this color is. Kind of reminds me of Arizona a little bit. So I'm used to the blue mic. Shouldn't make a difference, but I notice little details like that. I'm just a nerd like that. Um, I actually did want us to, as a congregation, just say a prayer specifically for Pastor Jerry and Susie this morning. So if you guys could just uh, join me um, in that, please. Lord God, um, we're thankful. God, we're thankful for every, um, you know, member here, every visitor here. Lord God, we're just grateful for everyone who's in the house of the uh, house of the Lord this morning. God, we just thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, we just we're thankful for our pastors, um, all of them. And we want to just give special thanks for Pastor Jerry and Susie this morning. Lord God, we pray that you keep them safe this morning. You keep them safe this whole trip, Lord God, and that your your providence would be with them on that ship, Lord God, that. Um, you know, that whether the ship is full of many believers or maybe some unbelievers in mass, Lord God, that the gospel will be proclaimed even there um, in their conferences, their get-togethers, their personal time, maybe meeting with individuals there while, while dining and, and, you know, hanging out on the deck, whatever they do, Lord God. Just pray that they would be edified, like Corey said, and that they would be rested and refreshed, God, and they would come back with an even greater fervor for you, Lord God, that they, even greater than the one they already have. God, so we're thankful to you primarily, and we're thankful for the leaders you've put here with us to, to shepherd us and to guide us. We just praise your holy name, Lord God, and I also just pray over the word this morning, Lord God, that the word really does transform, and I believe that with all my heart. I've seen it in my own life. I see it every day, every second. God, I just pray that you would transform us today, Lord God, that you would show us more of yourself this morning, Lord God, that you would um, speak through the text, that you would speak even through my imperfect lips, Lord God, and that we would see you for who you are. We'd worship you greatly, Lord God, and we would desire to let others know about you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, thanks for, um, thanks for welcoming me so kindly yet again. Um, this week, obviously, I'm up here. Next week, you guys will have Corey. So you guys get the two young guys that are just trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> maybe Corey might have a little more figured out than me. But um, I, think, I think him and I are both pretty grateful to be able to continue to be in um, this position of learning and, and, and submitting to, to Pastor and, and his discipleship towards us and what he's trying to teach us. Um, I wanted to just quickly say before we get into it, um, worship this morning was pretty incredible in the sense that there's sometimes when there's a piece of worship or even a huge chunk of it, um, like a nice piece of pie that just goes together with the word so good. Y'all ever had like milk and chocolate pie? It's just a, I, I like it. I don't know, it's a good, good combination. Um, and, and it's just sweet in your spirit. You just kind of want to tear up and praise the Lord. And uh, when, when Brother Kerry was sharing about his imperfections as a father and how he knows the right way, and how he's, he's responsible, and he's, he's held to that, that um, standard to teach his children the right way. He sees his shortcomings. It was just so beautiful because not only do I relate, having young children myself, but we were literally at um, uh, some of our family's house yesterday, and um, they're believers, and, and a huge part of our conversation was just talking about me and parenting and how parenting has continued to strengthen my relationship with the Lord. And I know everyone's in a different situation. I know some people um, struggle to have, you know, children and, and like there's all sorts of things like that. So I don't want to just like gloss over that. The Lord, the Lord is with you. And no matter what you're going through, whether you have like 50 kids or you don't have any, um, he loves you the same. It's just there's, there's like this extra um, blessing, if you will, that comes from the moments when I have to go to my four-year-old and say, daddy was wrong in that right? Like, daddy, daddy messed up. 
you know, and she even corrects me sometimes too. So she's, <laughs> she's learning. She, she knows. You know how kids are. They're honest. So my heart really resonated with that this morning, and I think for all of us, that was just really cool, and I just kind of wanted to expound on that some more. So thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. Um, so this morning, we're going to be talking about Ephesians, specifically chapters 1 and 2. Um, we're going to be talking about the grace of God and how, um, and another thing was Jessica alluded to this morning, you know, when she said there's really nothing else, guys. It's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can add to the work of God. It is God's grace alone that saves us. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to, uh, as believers, we're hopefully going to have an even better understanding of that. Maybe a reminder that gets us fired up. And if you're in here today and maybe you're not a believer, my hope is that you would really have no excuse leaving here <laughs> of not knowing how this really works, right? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the condition of mankind prior to their salvation. Again, a good reminder to those that are already saved and a good um, warning and uh, expression, a desire that those who are not saved would be saved. So uh, Ephesians is really cool, one of my favorite books. Um, actually, excuse me for a moment. I have a prop today. Yeah, I'm one of those guys now. I got a prop. So now y'all know this is the downfall of Patrick. He's using props now. Call Pastor Jerry. Say, you got to come back from the cruise. Just kidding. Some guys do use way too many props. It's kind of crazy, but that'll be explained later. Um, it's a cool story. So Ephesians, right? So Paul is writing the letter to the Ephesians. This is the, first, the church of Ephesus. And um, how many of you guys have ever heard of, like, the goddess Diana, right? Greek god, right? So the goddess Diana was the, the goddess of the hunt, Right, I had I kind of got um, I learned uh, reading through yesterday about Diana. I thought Diana was a goddess of something else, but I guess she's the goddess of the hunt, right? So she was kind of more of like a, a warrior woman, like a go out and hunt woman, I suppose, or goddess. Um, and in, in Ephesus, there was this big temple, Temple of Artemis, right? So all these Greeks and stuff, these Gentiles, would well, they go and they'd worship Diana? Well. You guys have probably noticed in all sorts of religions, pagan and, and maybe even sometimes like Catholic, you know, there's people always making jewelry. They're always making little like statues. Um, a lot of times they're just straight up idols. So Ephesus was deep in that, a big source uh, of income, and their economy worked off of these little idols, and these little trinkets and stuff like that, right? So what do you guys think when the Apostle Paul, who preaches the gospel, of repentance and grace and reconciliation to God comes through what that maybe does to their economy. It starts messing some stuff up, right? And we're not going to get into Acts today, but in Acts, it's documented in Acts, uh, I think chapter 19, chapter 20, we see that um, they were really getting fed up with Paul. I mean, they're really trying to get him out of there because these dudes, these silversmiths and these trinket makers and these jewelry makers, they're, they're losing money because as people are coming to Christ, what's happening? They're, they're casting down their idols, the feet of Christ. They're, they're crushing their idols. They're, throwing idols. they're saying, hey, I don't want this Diana. This Diana is a lesser God. This Diana isn't even a God at all. This Diana is just a demon in disguise, and I know the one true God. So that's just to build a little bit of kind of like what's going on. So there's believers there in Ephesus, um, and they're mostly Gentile. So a cool thing about Ephesians is there's not a whole lot, except for like in chapter 3, there's not a whole lot about, um, or there's not a whole lot, let's say, like relating to the Jews, you know, you see some books like Romans, it gets really heavy in certain areas. It's like, okay, like, you know, in the context here, the Jews are being addressed. Like, now the Gentiles are being addressed. Now they're both being addressed. Well, the Ephesians, they didn't really have a lot of that Jewish um, baggage, if you will, coming with them. So Paul is just digging into the glory of God, the, the preeminence of Christ, the uh, eternity's past of, of God and his plan for salvation. And it's just a wonderful book, and I love it. So anyways, without further ado, we're going to read through the first 14 verses of chapter 1. Then we're going to kind of break it up, and then we're going we're gonna to get into chapter 2. Um, and then eventually I'll be sharing about that jacket. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he had blessed us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. So that's, we're going to just go through verse 1 through 14 of chapter 1. We're not going to do the rest of chapter 1. Um, so that very first chunk, right, going back to verse 3, it talks about God the Father blessing us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing, choosing us before the foundation of the world, that we'd be holy and blameless before him. It says that he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. We can look back even to the garden. And we can see in Genesis chapter 3, where the Lord himself was walking through the garden. And as he, you know, he's, he's, he's getting ready to pronounce, essentially, the curses on the devil and mankind, on male and female, right? And then he promised, then he promised, right, that he would send the Messiah. He would send a Savior who would one day crush the serpent's head. The serpent would bite his heel. But even before that, we know, we all know that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, all the omnis, right? <laughs> so even before that, God knew that his son would have to die for our sins. Even before that, God knew. God knows every little thing. There's not a single thing out of his purview, right? I was having a discussion with a gentleman the other day, and um, really honest, and I love this. I love it when a person is honest, when they just flat out tell me, I don't believe in God, I'm not religious, but I'm willing to talk about this. I love that. It's so cool because I know we're not about to get into a fight. I'm not going to be, like, tempted by the devil to want to wanna get aggressive. Like, it's just a good conversation. Um, and he brought, up a lot of, he brought up a lot of really good questions um, and a lot of really good points. And one of the things he said was, he said that, um, he said, well, isn't the devil more or less an agent of God? He said, isn't the devil's a fallen angel? So he's kind of just like punishing people for God, right? And I said, man, that's a really good point and a really good like question. I said, but uh, no, biblically, no, that's not what's happening. Yes, the devil's a fallen angel. Yes, the devil is eventually going to be in hell. But the devil and his, all his fallen angels and all who are not found in the Lamb's book of life will burn in the lake of fire. The devil ain't going to be punishing no one then. He's going to be punished. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Like, there's none of this, again, Greek ideology is really what it is. This permeated, tried, tried to come in and mess up the gospel now for a thousand years. And all these other pagan ideas that there's almost like this relationship with God and the devil, like a Zeus and Hades type thing. That's not what it is. And that's never what it was. That's incorrect. Okay, so when it comes to talking about the truth and, and who God is, yes, he's sovereign. Yes, he's overall. There's nothing out of his purview. So, yeah, the devil does things, but it's not like God is unaware. So God, before everything, before everything, before time, before he created time for us, I should say, knew what he was going to do on that cross. Knew he was going to redeem his people for his glory Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. First Peter said uh, in verse 20, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Speaking, of course, of Jesus. Revelation 13, 8, this was talking about, in Revelation this is talking about all of those that will worship the beast, right? So it says, And all that dwell on the earth will worship it, the beast, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So God, in his infinite goodness, so good, no sin found in him, decided eternities past that in his love, he would die for a people that ultimately would not just betray him, but mock him and spit on him and despise his name amongst all the peoples of the earth. That is a good God. And that is, that is the, 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 the glory and the love found in his predestination, and that is the glory and the love found in his limitless knowledge of all things and how mighty he is. There is no Diana, there is no anything that can hold a candle against 
this Lord God of ours. He is God. He is the ruler of the universe. So in the next part, it said, in verse 7, it said, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. We know that God desires that none should perish. Again, in his infinite knowledge and all-knowingness, he desires that none should perish. Christ tore the veil, right? He made known the mystery of his will. There's no more trying to figure it out. We got to be careful sometimes when we're looking in the, the Old Testament, and this is what I mean by that. Because if we're not if we're not careful, we'll forget the areas where the new covenant has already sealed the deal. Now, or we we miss the spots where that's fulfilled, and we accidentally put ourselves in the past as a people group that we aren't. We we put ourselves in a position of a, a Jew a Jewish people that weren't redeemed yet, that didn't know the fullness of the mystery of God, and here it is. Paul's saying, "This is it, guys." This is the one who was prophesied. This is the one who would be born of a virgin. This is the one who would come, live a perfect life, and, and, and allow himself to die on this cross, to take the full wrath of God in our place, um, to unite all things in him. Uh, one of my favorite verses from Galatians, um, uh, chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay? So the point Paul's making there is he's saying when it all comes down to it, the Jewish people can't stand there and say, hey, I'm a son of Abraham. You know, I'm circumcised and everything. So, like, I'm good. The Gentile, I don't know about him. No. God's saying, like, you may have been circumcised of the flesh, but you're not circumcised of heart. That's what I care about. The Lord said, you got to be circumcised of heart. You must be born again, John 3, right? You must be born again. And to the Gentile, guess what? Yes, the Jews were my chosen people at first, but you're in the fold now too. And you were predestined too. He's telling, he's telling all of the recipients of this letter to the believers, you were all chosen in Christ. That means that even prior to the old covenant being written on stone and eventually on paper, Gentiles were part of this thing. God knew. Why would God not know the fullness of the plan? God knows. God knows that eventually all people that would hear that word of truth and would believe in him, he would redeem by his own blood and he would seal with his own spirit. Okay, so glory to God in that, right? And there is nothing. He mentions, um, he mentions slaves and free. Man, we know that's a tough one. Can you imagine that? The master of a slave and a slave. Then in Christ Jesus, there's no difference. We're, we're in a broken world, guys. I mean, we still got, you know, Corey's talking about it. We, you better believe slavery is still alive today. And the way the media and the way the world wants to portray it is not what it really is. What they're trying to say is slavery is not. I'm sorry, it's just not. What's really slavery is what's happening, like, in that movie. What's happening with these poor kids all over the world, whether it's um, sex trafficking or labor trafficking, whatever, it's wrong. It's slavery. And it's on a bigger scale than it's ever been in all of time. On this beautiful green and blue earth. <laughs> it's messed up. It's really messed up. But God provides redemption. And God is sending out people to save those. And he's sending out his gospel through his believers to save those spiritually. To give them an eternity with him. Alright, here we go. So picking up with verse uh, 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. Praise God. It's just those two scriptures just married together so well. Both written by Paul to different churches, going through different things, but still needing the same truth, that this is God's plan. And that our plan really is garbage compared to God's plan. 
I don't know how many times, I'm sure you guys know, when you're trying to speak with someone, whether you're evangelizing or just trying to have a godly discussion, how it's always the will of man that seems to want to disrupt the whole thing. Again, same, same guy I was talking to the other day, very respectful guy, praise God for that. But he said, well, yeah, but if it's by grace, you know, and it's all Jesus' work, and he did all that, that's good and all, but doesn't that kind of alleviate the responsibility from man to have to right his own wrongs? I mean, the guy was asking some stuff that it wasn't that I couldn't answer it. It was just he was asking in a way that I was like, I understand what you're saying because I used to be you. I get it. And I told him, I said, I remember. I remember on those, those Sunday mornings hanging out with friends, um, not at church, but, you know, like just at, throughout the day, just hanging on Sunday and hearing about the church kids that were out Saturday night doing stuff they ought not to be doing and how I'd sit there and say, man, there's just, there's just no way. Look. If they're a Christian, and that's what they're doing, and I'm not, I'm clearly a better person than them. And this is what I told him. I said, that's what I was doing, man. And, 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 and through a, a huge part of my youth, I allowed myself to look at young Christians, old Christians, and I don't know if they really were or not, but the fact is they're representing God, right? And this is why it is important that we do follow after Christ genuinely, because everyone's watching, guys. And you're going to have a bunch of little punk Patricks watching you. That's just how it is. So you can't please everyone, and the whole point isn't to wear a mask and be fake. We, need to re we have to be honest, but like you need to honestly be pursuing the Lord. Be making good decisions, being mindful of everything we do, young and old. Okay, so I'd, I'd see these kids, and I think that never once would I actually look in the mirror and say, well, what do I do? What if I held myself to these same holy standards that I'm holding them to? What about me? And then I told the guy at work, I said, that's when things began to change for me. But it started with reading the word of truth. That was my mirror, the mirror to my soul. And then I was able to say, man, you know, maybe all these years I was wrong. And maybe they were wrong too for getting drunk Saturday night before church. Probably were. But that's not what really matters. What matters is I'm sitting here as a, a Gentile unbeliever judging these people, putting myself in the place of God, when I myself am not right with the God of the universe. That's just, that ought not to be so, church. It just, it just shouldn't be. So God had to make me right. So how did he make me right? What did, what, what's Paul building up to here? Here we go, starting with verse 13. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. So here, here's what happened to me. I, I legitimately began reading this. And I mean, I know, I know God can use anything, but guys, when I sit here and pray, I just want you guys to know something Patrick really believes. Patrick really believes that this, not just this one specifically, but any good, like rightly translated Bible, the word of God, can transform you. Like I really believe honestly, with all my heart, and I was telling the dude this the other day, I really believe that if you go to this and you humble yourself at least to the point where you say, well, let me at least let this God of this book tell me who he is and let me not try to tell him who, who he is as I read it. Let me let him tell me who he is. If you at least do that, something will happen. Because I'll tell you what, I didn't get none past Genesis 4 or 5, and I started feeling this thing that is called conviction, and I didn't know what to call it. I, I, I did not know what to call it, but that's what it was. And it was also the, the gentle nudging and, per, and, and pursuing power of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that's what that was either. I grew up Catholic, and the Holy Spirit was just Father, Son, Holy. It was just that part. I didn't know what, I didn't know what any of that meant. I really didn't, just being honest with you guys. Didn't know the Holy Spirit was a person of the Trinity, Nothing. But God was pursuing me because I, I heard this word of truth. And as I began to read more and more and I get to the Gospels and, and, and I was being discipled in a sense by one of my teachers, I started to see that, that Jesus was, as I said years ago, being the, the nerd that I am, he was the main character of the Bible. I remember saying to my teacher, I said, this, this Jesus, he's like the main character. And he kind of laughed. He was like, yeah, yeah that's kind of the whole point. Like, it all, it all points to him. Like, the Old Testament, the New Testament, everything in between, it, it's all about him. It's pointing to him. Why? Because, again, we want to do things in our own will. We want to take, take saving power, and as the man suggested the other day, we want to say, well, let me right my, my wrongs. Well, how do you do that? 
I want to know. Can someone give me a list? Can anyone here give me a list of the things I need to do? And then what about the things I shouldn't have done? What happens to them? And what about the things that I shouldn't have done that I haven't done yet, but I will do? What happens to those? Can someone give me this list? And I think that's the point a lot of us have to get to. And maybe believers in here, we need a reminder. Because I, maybe y'all were here um, last month, I was talking about sanctification. Sometimes we get that kind of jacked up too. Sometimes we, we, we accidentally start making it like more legalistic and it's not supposed to be. Like it really is Christ alone. You hear that word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and one of the first things that has to happen is, I can't do this on my own. I can't do this in my own will. I can't do nada, nothing, zilch. I, I can't do it. It's got to be Christ Jesus. And we hear that word of truth, the gospel of our, our salvation, and he seals us with the promised Holy Spirit. I'm going to just echo the same thing pastors told us for, forever, and I'm going to then explain my, my prop, right? <laughs> it's not really a prop, it's just a jacket. I'm just being goofy. Um, when the Holy Spirit enters us, when you are truly born again, this thing is a done deal. This whole preordained, predestined plan of God that he had even before the foundation of the world, crucifying his son before the foundation of the world, you need to understand this is a done deal. This is where you need to understand how important you actually are. Okay? You're a sinner saved by grace, but this is how important you actually are. If you truly are born again, you were known from eternity's past. You, if, you ever, if you've ever come to this place where you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed, you've been his son and daughter forever. I can't, I can't tell you that in this area, God somehow didn't know. He knows all. Okay, he knows all. And we're not going to try to contort that, and we're not going to try to make, use that to teach some doctrine or anything of, of man like that. I'm just telling you, this is what the scripture says. Like, if you are found to be in him right now, you were in him back then. And that's why I tell people, challenge yourself and read this. You might be a son of God, you just don't know it. You just haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. You just haven't been born again yet. You just haven't been baptized yet. When we're preaching, guys, we're not shooting, we're not, we're not drunk at the bar throwing darts at a target. We're, we're lovingly and tactfully throwing darts at what may be sons and daughters of the living God. And if they reject you, that doesn't mean they've rejected God forever. Jesus said that they can blaspheme my name. <laughs> We're not encouraging blaspheming the name of Jesus, but the fact is, I know how much I blaspheme Jesus' name. He says, you can blaspheme my name and be forgiven. So guys, we gotta keep, just, just to touch on, touch on this for a moment, moment, keep plowing through, keep planting seeds, keep, keep watering, because we know God provides the growth. We know God's the one that's gonna reap. We know that God is really the one who's sowing anyways. We're not doing much. The obedience that Carrie desires, I desire it too. Because every time I have a moment when I'm actually talking with someone, and the Lord's like, yeah, you see why you're supposed to talk to them? You see how encouraged you were? No, they didn't get saved by anything you said. No, they weren't born again right then and there, but you see how much strength I gave you in that, how much of a faith builder that was because you were obedient? That's what we need in church. We need to perceive that. We need to, we need to, to run after that obedience to to have an intensity after that type of obedience so that we can, we can be part of God's redeeming work to this lost world. And, he and the Holy Spirit really is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Amen. And that's going to finish the chapter one part. Now I'm going to show you guys the, the silly jacket. So really cool is that when I got this jacket, uh, my mom was visiting. I'll put it on. It's actually it's kind of chilly up here, but I'm glad it's not hot. So I already knew I, already knew I was going to marry Mickey before the foundation of the world, right? <laughs> but who knew, right? So anyways, I had a meeting with my now father-in-law. He's probably people I, I don't look up to too many men, but he's like, he's definitely at the top of that list, just being honest. Not idolatry now. Don't, don't be trying to get me on idolatry. I just really respect him and I love him, and, and he's someone I want to model myself after, you know what I mean? Well, he told me, he said... Okay, if you want to marry Mickey, I'm going to give you my blessing, but I want to meet your parents. And I was like, man, 
that's going to be, actually, I was like crying. I was like, oh, it's going to be hard. My dad, things aren't good with my dad. Well, can you get your mom? And this is, my mom is human like the rest of us, right? Like, she, she's, she's just like the rest of us. But I'll tell you what, that woman sometimes, many times has blown my mind. I call her, and the same day I call her and struggle to basically ask, is there any way you could get to Jacksonville this, like, weekend? She's like, I'll go. Before I could say anything, I'll go. I said, well, yeah, don't you have to talk to Mark, my stepdad? She's like, yeah, I will, I will, but I'll go. And it was like not long after, she's like, hey, I'm looking at tickets, whatever, and, and I'm coming. So we planned this whole big ordeal of how I was going to propose to Mickey, and it was really great, and Barney and Linda were there, and it was super cool, okay? Um, so back to the jacket. So that weekend, I got this jacket, and um, it said something really interesting on it, and I didn't really make a big, oh, now I'm taking it back off, darn it. <laughs> so the company is called Dravis or Dravis, right? And it says, it says, and this is, um, this came from like one of those like skate shops, right? Like a skateboard store. So you know how you skaters typically are. They're kind of like, they just have a certain like, uh, I'm trying not to sound like a jerk. They have like a, a certain aura about them, you know, like they're kind of like cool and like going to stick it to the man type of guys, whatever. Anyways, it says heading nowhere, misguided since 2010. <laughs> So I was like, I was like, well, I'm not gonna like get rid of the jacket. Like, Christ has power over that. I'm not claiming that over my life. It's also not written in big letters on the front of the jacket or the back. But it it, it kind of bothered me. So I was like, well, you know, what can I do about that? So during this time, I had met a guy at, at my old job, and the guy was like an on fire believer in Christ. But there was this one thing that we would disagree about, and even one time actually. Um, this guy met up with me and Matt and Corey at the furniture store. He came to some of the man-up groups, um, and there was this one thing. He was really stuck on being able to lose your salvation, like really stuck on it. And, I mean, he was kind of like this really, like, uh, he, only, he only worked with me for like a year and a half. Then he moved, and a whole bunch of stuff happened with him and his family. But, anyways, um, he would kind of come to me alone, and he'd be like, hey, man, what you doing? I'd be like, oh, I'm reading the scriptures. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, I figured you'd be over here reading the scriptures. And then he would just start talking about, like, salvation. And he, I mean, it was a big deal to him. Um, and he, there was all these, like, signs and wonders in his family and how his dad, like, casts out demons. And, and I'm not saying that's not true. It's just that there was a lot of emphasis on those things. And then it was almost like because he's seen those things in his family, whatever he said would trump whatever I said right? So it was almost like this battle of um, maybe a little bit of uh, intellectuality, a little bit of spiritual abuse, where it was like, not that he was abusing me, I'm just trying to describe it, that he is like, when we get to that point, he'd be like, well, I know because I've experienced this, you can lose your salvation, right? And then we'd go through the scriptures, and he'd try to find all the ones that, that maybe looked like they pointed that way, and, and I, was, I, was, I was struggling because I was still a new believer, and, and I guess I just didn't have a good enough hold on, on this passage, right? And I, and I went to Pastor Jerry one day. I walked right up here, and I said, Pastor, I said, I just, like, I want to believe we're saved until the day of redemption outside of our will and what we do or don't do. But I'm struggling, and there are some verses, you know, and there are some things that I'm kind of like, ah. And he said, Patrick, read Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. And he's like, and I mean read it. I mean, he basically conveyed to me, like, read it with all your heart. He didn't tell me, don't, don't think that. This is that because I said. He said, go, go to this, right? And that's why I tell you guys how much I believe it, because we always want to take verses in context. We want to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. We don't want to just cherry pick and isolate things. But what's being said in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 is something that's being said throughout all of the Scripture. And we have to marry the scriptures together because it's the same God. It's the same Holy Spirit. He's one. He's uniting all things. He's not trying to divide all things. Okay, so we have to realize that a lot of times we do have misunderstandings on things. And this was hard for me, but I began to read and read and read. And until finally, I mean, I just accepted it. That when I heard the word of truth, the gospel of my salvation and believed in him, I was sealed with the promise of Holy Spirit until the day of redemption to the praise of his glory. Now, I'm not going to say I've never struggled or I've never then revisited that conversation because I've met many believers that believe that, right? But I've gone into it with the maturity. 
and a love and a compassion towards them because of what I went through with this other person. Right? I'm not knocking on them for it, but I am trying to say, hey, I think you, think you, may, be, you may be misguided since 2010. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay, so then, then what I did was, on the sleeve, there's this cool little shield thing, and, and I know y'all can't see it, but anyways, I wrote on there with Sharpie, Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, and then there's these two arrows kind of making like an X, and right in between that I drew a cross. Um, and I don't know, that just kind of made the jacket special for you. You know, my mom bought it during a very, very, very important, important occasion, and um, I got to kind of repurpose it and redeem it from some foolishness that was written on there. So I hope y'all like my prop. That's, that's it. All right, we're done. Y'all go home. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> next time I have a blow-up pool with floaties and be baptizing people and with, with Nerf guns and Pastor Rick, you're gonna be <laughs> you're gonna be in there, Pastor. You gotta get baptized. We can baptize you again, man. Maybe uh, you may be even again after that. Um, okay, so y'all get to know a little bit about how this has impacted me. I really hope that that would impact you the same way. Now here's where I want us to see. So why is all that important? Again, for the believer, it's a good reminder, and for the unbeliever, here we go. Ephesians two. By grace through faith. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So we see clearly Paul is still addressing believers here. He's reminding them of where they were before hearing the word of truth and accepting the gospel of salvation. And where, where were they before that? They were living in death. The death that was ushered in by Adam. The death that the world has lived in since the first Adam. And only those who have accepted and, re and been redeemed by the second Adam, Christ Jesus, are now free from. And will be fully free from at the day of, of redemption when, when we're raptured or when we pass on and the Lord then eventually decides, yo, it's judgment day. It's going down, guys. It's going down. When it says here that we're following the prince of the power of the air, that's a verse that, you know, I, I, don't, I personally don't get bored reading this. I don't know how many times I've read Ephesians. I don't get bored because you know how you can't see air? Doug, can you see air? You're a pretty smart dude, but can you see air? You work on airplanes. Can you see air? I just want to make sure you couldn't see air. <laughs> All right. You can't see air. You can't see wind. Wind can sometimes have a very positive effect. For example, the way people and engineers create stuff like aircraft and the way they work things like high pressure and low pressure and how you can get a giant piece of metal to fly through the sky. I know how it works, but sometimes I'm still like, that's dark magic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you can't see it. So you can't, you can't really harness the wind. When we see Jesus speak of wind, we see it in, in, a, in a, a, a very hopeful sense in John 3. When we see, he says, you don't know where the wind is going. He's describing the way being, someone is born again and this process of receiving the Spirit when they, when they believe in the Son of God. But the prince of the power of the air is something that always gets me because, like the man I was talking to the other day, I get the sense that he really thinks that he is in control of his own life. Priding himself on this free will that, I hear what this Patrick is saying, but like, I believe what I believe. I've been all over the world. I've studied different religions. This was something he told me. And very, very cool about it. Not, not cocky about it, but still, knowing the way the hearts of men tend to work, knowing my own, you know, I've heard this before, whatever, like, I'm, I'm doing my own thing, not knowing the prince of the power of the air is really guiding his sails. And guys, this is the world. I don't know why I myself, we, but I myself, just talking about myself, waste so much time wondering why the world's doing what they're doing. I mean, like, do we not see that they're being guided by the prince of the air? That they're living in disobedience as sons of obedience because they're not yet fully, fully drafted into the fold as sons and daughters of God. And that's kind of offensive. 
Like, you know, if you told someone, well, I know you think you believe what you believe, but really you just believe in the devil. You're following the devil. Like, that's not, it might not be the best way to go about it. But what the scripture is showing us is that no one's really in control of their own life. You know, it's something that got me when I was a teen because I always, I started, I started kind of going against the grain, getting with my own clique of friends, kind of being into what we were into, trying to be different than the cool kids, but still trying to be cool kids ourselves, right? Because everyone wants to be cool. But what I realized was the, the most counterculture person of all time has always been Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's never been anyone else. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's always been Jesus. That's, that's whose wind I want to be carried by, right? So that's who we were. And if you're not in the fold yet, I'm telling you that's who you are. You're not, you're being controlled by the prince of the power of the air. You could throw some, a book at me later or something. Like, I'm just telling you, and I love you when I'm telling you this, if that's anyone in here. Like, that's just it. This is my opportunity. When I get to talk with people one-on-one, believe me, it's different ways the Spirit leads us, and there's different ways to communicate with someone. But when we're here, this is our opportunity, whether it's me, Pastor Rick, Corey, Pastor, this is our opportunity to just address the flock and those that maybe have wandered in. And we welcome those who've wandered in. I'm not, there's, no tr- there's no manipulation or trick behind this, guys. I'm just telling you what this says, what that verse specifically says, and what it means. It's who we once were. And for some of us, it may be who we still are. And, 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 and guess what? I want you to know, you're, you're being deceived. My heart goes out to you. I'm trying to tell you about the one who can save you from that. Jesus can give you eyes to see and ears to hear. The scales will fall from your eyes just like Paul. And you will no longer be manipulated and toyed with by the God of this air. Okay? Verse 4. God, being rich in mercy. I'm sorry. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with, and I'm sorry, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Romans 10, verse 10 says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on him, on the name of the Lord, will be saved. He's rich in mercy. It's the greatness of his love. It's his kindness. All of this is to display his kindness and his glory. And that we can receive that. And we can know him as the kind and loving God he is. Romans also mentions elsewhere um, how it's, it might be the same chapter, uh, how it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Our infinite holy God is, is orchestrating all these things together. I, I, still, I, just, I just always remember my, my teacher saying, it's all orchestrated. As he would, as he would preach during class, and he would, he would just tell us, like, basically he was just telling us, like, God is sovereign. Like, he knows what he's doing. He's always known what he's doing because he's had a plan from the beginning. As Paul's stressing... He's, he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In the coming ages, he may show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And then there it is, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We cannot come into this thinking we have something to offer or to add and some of us we since we were taught wrong before we do and thank God for his grace that he's sanctifying that junk out of us right he's getting that out of us it is really not by us guys you know why because as I told the gentleman the other day there is this one there's a lot of things but there's this one specific thing I could definitely say with utmost confidence about our Christian faith 
that makes it separate and distinct from every other religion or man-made practice or even witchcraft and all that stuff. That it's God's work alone that makes us holy. A lot of a lot of people and a lot of groups have that completely backwards and completely wrong. Again, they're trying to somehow add in the will of man as something to be noted. When we know that our works are filthy rags. We know that our concepts and our ideas and what Patrick thinks is great and is what everyone needs to hear is really not that good. But if it's the Lord, then it is good because he is good and he is full of grace and mercy. That verse 13 that I read from Romans 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You have to hear, marrying the scriptures again, you have to hear that word of truth. You have to hear that gospel of your salvation and make it your own to come to the place where you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. There is no one getting saved on accident. It is all 100% purposeful and intentional. And church, I just want you to know that, again, when we preach this gospel, when we share this Ephesians 2.10, that it is by grace through faith that you are saved, that we are, we are sending an arrow of truth to that person's soul. And at that moment, they have enough to receive. They have enough to accept. We're not blinded and misguided in this. Please fight. Please fight this fight of faith. There's, there's nothing more meaningful you can do. I'm guilty of what Corey said a lot of times, wondering about what I'm going to eat after church more than what I'm eating at church or what I'm feeding others at church. We got to recognize that. Don't stop looking in the mirror. Recognize that. Because for all those that say, well, you're just depending on God because you can't do it yourself, and you just don't want to do the work, you know what we do in that moment? Turn the cheek. Give them your jacket. Go with them the extra mile. That's the point. Because you know what? At a certain point, because I've experienced it, these same people will eventually be broken down by the kindness of God that is meant to lead them to repentance. And they'll say, man, it was always right here. This gospel truth of old was always right here. And I thought, because the world is so vast and there's so many things that caught my eye, I never realized it was the prince of the power of the air that was really guiding me and steering me. But now the God of the universe, the one that has ultimate authority and power, saving power over any spiritual force, over any principality of darkness, over any man, over anything anyone can say, is now reaching down to grab me. Don't reject that. And actually, I got news for you. If you're his son from an attorney's past, ultimately you will not be able to resist. He will save you. He will redeem you. And when you're preaching to others, look at them as if they're a child of God, knowing that they're not, but look at them as if they're a child of God. The same way you look at your own kid when they're doing something really stupid, and you're like, that's not who you are. That's not who you're going to be. You're doing it right now, but that's not who you're going to be. I'm helping form me, I'm forming you and molding you into who you are. That's what God's doing with us. So I'm cutting off a little earlier than expected, but just want to give you guys that opportunity. If you want to, I want to ask uh, Pastor Rick, um, if you wouldn't mind, to, to come up just for a minute. I just, want to, I just want to open this up. If anyone wants to come up specifically for prayers of, um, for others that we want to be saved, um, or yourself, or just, you know, anything, I want you to come talk with, with Pastor Rick and, and myself. And if any of the elders would like to join too, just want to take this time for that. If anyone, if anyone is feeling led towards that, and there's no pressure, if not, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, Lord, I'm just going to, Thank you for your saving power once again. Thank you for your goodness, God. Lord, I ask you bless the flock this week. 
And I ask that you would grow our flock. You would bring us where we need to be, Lord God. You would lead us and guide us. And that we would submit ourselves to your word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Lord God, that we would be sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, Lord God. In Jesus' name.